morning. Welcome to my talk about uh, building a Q&A bot using Deep Learning for J. Um, before I start, a uh, raise of hands. Who's developing Java applications on a daily basis? Good. You found the right talk. It's only Java today. I normally do a lot of Python talks, so um, just to warn you. Uh, I'm Willem Wijns. I'm a uh, technical evangelist and AI engineer. Uh, we don't have an official title for me yet, but uh, we'll get there someday. Uh, I do a lot of work in artificial intelligence, machine learning. I help specifically uh, help customers get started with building things like chatbots, uh, solving image recognition problems, uh, uh, that sort of stuff. So that's what I normally do. Um, today I'm talking about Deep Learning for J. If you have any questions during the session, please ask them to the app. Uh, we have some time left at the end of the session to discuss the questions and get back to you. Um, and otherwise, you will get an answer through Twitter or my website. Uh, that works as well. So my talk is basically in three parts. Um, my goal for today is not to teach you everything there is to know about deep learning, because that would take a couple of days to learn. And even then, you're not an expert. I've been doing this for quite a few years now, and I'm still learning every day. It's a very complicated top a topic that a lot of large companies like Google and Facebook and Microsoft are doing a lot of research in. You can get a PhD for that, and I don't have that. So um, just to be clear, I'm, I'm just another developer doing this kind of stuff. I figured this out on my own um, with a lot of help from other people. Um, first, we'll talk about deep learning. What is it? In, in, on a conceptual level. Um, then we'll talk about how can you use these concepts in combination with deep learning for j to build a model that's capable of answering frequently asked questions. Um, you've probably heard about this. Uh, almost every website you go to, a web shop or something like Go to Berlin, or uh, maybe Netflix has a frequently asked questions page. They do a great job. But I thought, well, let's turn that around and build something else. Let's build a chatbot that's capable of understanding your questions and then find the answer in the database of frequently asked questions. Uh, you might be thinking by now, hey, that's a search problem. Yeah, it typically is. But I'm going to take an alternative approach to that. Um, so uh, we'll use a neural network that basically encodes your question into something that's recognizable for the computer, and he will find the right answer. At the end of my talk, I will spend a little bit of time then explaining, well, we've built this model, we've trained it on our computer, how are you going to use it in a typical Java application? I'm going to show you a little bit of code in Spring Boot specifically, because a lot of people tend to use that, uh, on how to use Deep Learning for J in a production situation. It's going to be very small. I will show you a lot of things about Deep Learning for J and not necessarily everything there is to know about integrating this sort of stuff. But don't worry, all the code is up on GitHub. You can download it, a lot of people have done so, and uh, you can browse it and see what I've done and maybe use that for your own project. So I've put up a small animation of my uh, chatbot. This is uh, Microsoft Bot Framework, by the way, that I'm using. Um, I can ask a question to my bot, where can I find more information about the sessions? Uh, typing error, oh, another one. And the bot will answer, and he says, well, I can't give you any specific information, but there's something up on the website. So that, that's basically the idea of what we're building today. Before I'm going to talk about my chatbot, let's first dive into what is deep learning exactly? And before I do that, uh, a raise of hand, how many people are using machine learning today? Any people doing it on production? There's very few still. Ooh. A few more than in Amsterdam. There was one person in Amsterdam that was doing machine learning on production. So when I talk about artificial intelligence, um, there's a lot of different definitions in the field that we can talk about. Uh, there's the official scientific definition. That's not the one I want to follow today. Um, when I talk about artificial intelligence, I'm talking about computer programs that show behavior that's similar to what we humans are capable of. It's an apparent human intelligence. It doesn't mean that your computer is learning anything. It's doing something that's very smart, and it almost seems like it's doing magic for you, and that makes it more human. For example, 
very early artificial intelligence applications were about chess computers playing chess. Those computers didn't learn anything, and you could beat them very easily. But still, to me and to others that have played chess on their computer, I think you will agree with me that it felt like someone else is playing chess with you. So that, that's, that's what I think about in, in terms of artificial intelligence. One area in artificial intelligence is about machine learning. These are the kind of algorithms you, heard, you, you hear about a lot today. These are algorithms that allow the computer to learn things. We give the computer examples of things that we've seen in the past. We've, we give the computer some expected output with those examples, and he will learn the rules. He will basically learn what the connection is between that input and the expected output that we give it. That's machine learning on a very high level. Then, when you look at machine learning, we're capable of exploring very simple relationships between input and output. Those are very, very basic. Still very powerful, but not powerful enough anymore. When you look at images and sound, it becomes impossible to do anything with that, with just basic machine learning. Scientists discovered this problem, and they said, well, we need something that's more clever at that. It's better at that. And that's, that's become the field of deep learning. And deep learning is about neural networks, using complicated models that are capable of understanding very complex data structures and making sense of that data structure. So what does a neural network look like? Uh, you've probably seen this somewhere on the internet. Anybody haven't seen this picture before or something similar? Nobody. Cool. This is a neural network. A neural network is built out of several layers, and these layers all perform a simple transformation. The first layer is an input layer. This is where we accept the data into the neural network. This layer does nothing. It's just a conceptual thing. The input of a neural network can be binary encoded pixels. It can be numbers for any kind of thing, as long as we can translate it into a numeric value. At the end of the neural network, we have an output layer. This produces the final answer to your question, basically. All the layers in between perform, perform calculations. They transform your input in such a way that at the end, you get an output that you probably expect, or maybe not. Depends on how well we're doing. In between this out input layer and output layer, there are one or more hidden layers. And this is where the power of a neural network lives, actually. When I have a single layer neural network, it's basically an old-fashioned machine learning algorithm. It does one transformation. When I have several layers, then I start to get the capability of learning things that we would normally not be able to. So if you ever see a neural network without a hidden layer, it's not a neural network. It has to have one hidden layer at least. All these nodes you see in this graph are neurons. And this is where the magic happens in a neural network. When I zoom in, a neural, in into a neural, a neural in my neural network, it looks similar to this. A neural network is modeled after our brain. Our brain has all these brain cells that have uh, several inputs and an output. And th when they get sufficient stimulation in the form of an electrical signal, they activate the output. And this is how a neural neuron also works. But that's about it. This is where the comparison between biology and computer science stops. I won't talk about it ever again. What happens inside a neuron is that we accept one or more input signals on the left, and we apply this signal by a certain weight. And this produces numbers that are, in some cases, very large, and in some cases, very small. We add those numbers up into one big number, and we pass this through an activation function. And this produces a signal on the output that we can use. Basically, what happens here is we perform a mathematical multiplication of the input numbers, 
And this produces a new number. Basically what it does, it transforms your data and that's all it does. So I talked about this activation function. Something really weird happens inside the neuron. If I just would multiply some input signal, uh, for example, if I want to predict something about a house, the price of a house, I would say number of bedrooms is an input, the living space, number of bathrooms, a garage. I would take all those numbers, multiply them by certain weights, and add them up. And that's all that happens. But that doesn't give me any intelligent behavior. You need this activation function that looks like this. Basically, what happens inside the neuron is if I have a very high input, in the case of a sigmoid activation, I will get a 1 on the output. If a very low activation, negative, it won't do anything. It will say it's a 0. And in between, there's a, a very steep curve along which values are sort of getting through. So basically, a neural network is nothing more than taking in numbers, transforming those numbers in such a way, using this technique, to produce a number that means something on the output. And that's what you define as a developer. You define which numbers you put into a neural network, and you define what the number that comes out of a neural network means. So basically, when you build a neural network, it looks like this. It has an input, several layers with trainable parameters. Those are the weights that we can learn. And it produces an output. So when we want to optimize a neural network to do something correctly, you have to do it like this. The first step is we have this structure and layers. We have these parameters. We choose random values for these parameters. We don't know what the correct transformation is for our data to predict the price of a house, for example. We then make an initial pred prediction, which is, of course, very, very wrong. But let's do it anyway, see where we stand. And we take this output and feed it into a loss function, because if you want to train your neural network to learn anything, you have to give it a sample, which is going to produce your prediction, and a target value for which you're going to optimize. And the loss function basically calculates the difference between the two, between our target and the input that we put into the neural network, the prediction. We then use this to feed an optimizer. And this optimizer is a function that's capable of reducing the amount of error, that's the distance between my target and my prediction, to a level where it's acceptable. It's never going to be zero. It's acceptable. And this optimizer then produces new values for these parameters in my layers, which will hopefully get better at predicting the right thing. So if I would apply this to a very concrete example, for example, the price of a house, I would put in the properties of my house in terms of floating point numbers into my neural network, make a prediction. This will output a price for my house, a predicted price. I, however, know what the price is of that particular house, because I sold it before. I use a loss function to calculate the difference between the two. And then I ask the optimizer, hey, dear optimizer, I have this big difference. Can you make sure that this gets smaller? And he would update the parameters for each of these properties of my house in such a way that it gets better at predicting the price of a house. This is repeated many thousands of times. It will do so in very small steps. It doesn't get the right answer directly because that's a neural network is too complicated for that. And each time we show the full data set of samples, we'll get better at predicting the price of a house or classifying a question you ask to a neural network. This is exactly how most of the deep learning frameworks work. You don't define any neurons yourself. You don't define the mathematical formulas. You don't spend any time uh, optimizing things yourself. Uh, that's not what you do as a developer. That's all done for you. And talking about this loss function, you don't, think about, you don't have to think about this. This is a very complicated formula, right? I think 
I see someone saying, hmm, hmm. <laughs> you're the first one saying that. I personally feel that this is very complicated stuff. This is a formula that basically calculates the distance between a predicted category and a real category. Okay, cool. But that's all I have to understand. A lot of these loss functions that people use in a daily basis are defined by scientists back in the 60s, when Conway was first starting out doing computer science. And we can still use those today. So don't worry if you don't understand a single word of what it's, it's saying here. You don't need to. Basically, how I build neural networks today is that I think of, oh, I need to predict the price of a house. That means I need to have a loss function that can calculate the distance between the actual price and the predicted price. And it has to be an absolute value. If, for example, I'm trying to predict whether someone is, is, is causing any problems in my system because he's uh, doing a fraudulent transaction or not, I want to detect fraud, then I have to do something, oh, it's a category fraud or not. I need to have a loss function that basically says, oh, what's the real category and the predicted category, and what's the difference between that? It's a binary cross-entropy function for those who are interested in that. But that's how I think about it. I, I look it up in a manual and say, oh, this is the loss function I need, and that's all there is to it. But in case you're curious, how does it work underneath the covers? So let's assume that I can draw a chart that on the x axis displays all the weights of my neural network. And on the y axis, you will see the loss, the output of the loss function when I make a prediction using my neural network. At some point, there will be an optimum. There will be the best possible prediction you can get in, in your life. It's at the bottom of this curve. To the left and to the right of this curve, to the lower bottom, there are two hills, I call them. These are the, the slopes that I have to descend to get to the lowest point. And when I initially choose a, a set of parameters for my neural network, it will be somewhere on this curve, but I don't know where. It's like standing on a mountain with a blindfold and not knowing where to go. And the only thing you can do is try to set your foot down on the floor and basically try to feel whether or not you're on the slope or on a flat spot. That's all you can do, and that's how the computer does it as well. But it does it in a very clever way. Because what we can do is when we transform this neural network into a mathematical formula, and we put this into a loss function, we can basically de derive a function from this very big formula that basically tells me, hey, you're standing here on this slope, and this is how fast we need to go down to get to the optimum, given that we're here today. And what I do is I follow this slope by simply using this de derived formula, and I can make a small step down the mountain. Of course, it isn't a state straight line, so I have to repeat this process over and over and over and over again. 10,000 times, millions of times, that can happen. But at the end, I know that at some point I will get down in this valley. And this is how a computer calculates the best weights for your neural network. Do I have to worry about this? No, but it's also useful to know. I've, sh I've just shown you a very simple version of the, what happens in a neural network. If you ask an average neural network, hey, can you plot your weights and loss output for that? you get something like this. It is a Himalaya, I call this. What happens at some point, near the red dots on the, in the middle of the picture, I will start my neural network with very underwhelming parameters. And it will try to walk down this mountain range into a point where it says, oh, now it's working, now it's cool. But like I told you before, it's like having an, a blindfold in front of your eyes. You can't see where you're going. So what happens in some cases, it will get to a valley which seems good at first, but we know there's another valley that's much deeper, much lower weight, much better parameters for a neural network. This happens a lot in neural networks because it's very complicated stuff. So you might get unlucky. Um, each time I have to teach people about machine learning, I always say machine learning is wrong. There's always a problem with machine learning because it's never perfect. That's because of this kind of stuff that's happening. It's very sad, but very true. 
Um, one of the best ways to counteract this problem is talk to your business person and ask them, how much improvement do you want? Usually, we, as data scientists, we talk about, uh, yeah, I have an accuracy of uh, 95%. Cool. Uh, how many hours did you spend? Yeah, a few thousand. OK, that's very useful. But how useful is it to your customer? Did you ask them? Because the other way around, if you don't reach an accuracy of 95% on, on your neural network predictions, then what? Is it bad? No, it doesn't have to be. Because if you can predict 60% of the cases right, and that still improves their business process or their quality of life, that's still a good, a good thing. So if you start out with building neural networks, don't aim for the highest metrics possible. Don't do that. Help yourself smart, start small. So I've just shown you some basic concepts without too much math uh, about what a deep learning uh, uh, model is and uh, how neural networks work. Let's explore how this works in Deep Learning for J. So Deep Learning for J is a deep learning framework for Java. And it's the only one for Java. Usually, people work in R or Python when they do machine learning. This makes this framework very unique, I think, because now you, as a Java developer, can start, use, start to use deep learning as well. I personally feel that's very cool. If you just start out, you don't want to learn a new language. You just want to learn machine learning or deep learning instead. And maybe you will switch to Python because TensorFlow is much more up to date. But yeah, if you just start out with your first model, then this is a great solution. Um, this framework is originally developed by a company called SkyMind. Uh, they developed it for a couple of years, I think, three or four years. And nowadays, it's part of the Eclipse Foundation. So it's fully open source. It's free. You can use it on, uh, on your computer. Uh, it works with both CPU-based training and GPU-based training. Um, because if you look at a neural network, there's a lot, a lot of stuff that you need to calculate. I've built neural networks that have five and a half million parameters that need to be optimized. And each of those parameters have to be optimized in 10,000 steps or more. As you can imagine, that's a lot of calculation power you need. Uh, luckily, though, I have a laptop that has a pretty good GPU in it, and it will speed my training process up by 100 times. So that's a, quite a big improvement. Um, if you ever start to use Deep Learning for J, I can recommend that. This is a, a sort of global overview of what Deep Learning for J is. I'm not going into detail of all the parts that are there. Basically, what happens is they, they developed an, uh, a library called ND4J. That's uh, 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 a library that, that does vector math. And that's all it does. Because neural networks is all about vector and matrix multiplication. They did so in such a way that they used the, the power of the CPU, or if you want, power of a GPU to calculate all the things. It's a native library. It's built in C++, and there's a Java layer on top of that, because Java itself is not fast enough for this kind of job. So what you will see is that if you run on Linux, you have a different binary of your application than when you run on Windows. Um, they fix all that. They include all the weird jar files and, and that sort of stuff. Uh, but that's something you have to think about. If you, if you build it on Windows, it probably only runs on Windows. Uh, on top of this vector math library, there's Deep Learning for J itself. This is basically the library that defines the layers that we saw in our picture earlier. Deep Learning for J works with layers. And on top of that, there's uh, a few utilities that you can use to do typical things with neural network. So let's take a look at how um, we can use Deep Learning for J to build a neural network. It's a three-step process. First, we have to think about the architecture of our neural network. What does it look like? Then the second step is to make sure that we feed it data that it understands and that we can understand. And we'll get to that in a, in a minute. Uh, and at the end, we'll train the neural network to basically understand what we're saying to the chatbot, and it will find the right answer to our question. So the first step is to define an architecture that will help us learn the features from a question. What does a question mean? Then we'll encode the questions into in such a way that the neural network can understand it. 
Basically, we're going to translate words to numbers and back. And then finally, we'll choose the most optimal parameters to do so. So the first step is to define an architecture for a neural network. When I think about search, that's what this is actually, an FAQ bot. Basically what it does, if I ask a question, it will search for it in my database. That's what I would do normally. And we're going to do that here as well, but in a little bit of a different way. And how does a search work? Well, I could, of course, find every single word in my list of possible answers and try to calculate which one is the most relevant. That's what Google does. That's what Elasticsearch does. That's what all the search engines do. Um, I have a slightly different approach. What I'm going to do is I'm going to build a neural network that basically compresses my data in a much smaller format. It creates a fingerprint of the data. And I do this by first using a layer with a lot of neurons, equal to the number of words that I have in my vocabulary, and then a layer with a smaller amount of neurons to compress the data into a representation that's smaller, and another one, and another one, and another one. And then comes the funny thing, because at the end of this arrow shape that gets smaller, I will start to widen it again. And this is kind of weird. What am I doing? I'm going to train this neural network by saying, hey, this input uh, representation, these words, I need them back at the other end. Thank you very much. And oh, by the way, in the middle, I want them compressed. And this is a trick. We call this an automatic encoder. By putting in words at the start and expecting those same words again, I'm basically teaching the computer how to compress data and restore that data again to its original form. It's basically a zip algorithm, but much more complicated and much more expensive, basically. But it's a very cool trick, because if I have this small rep representation in the middle, I can search very fast. I have to compare less parameters with my search index. That's basically what happens. So what I do next is I, uh, OK, I train this first part of my neural network, and then I hook up a second neural network, a very classic one, to the middle of my layer set that basically says, give me the, this compressed representation and classify it to one of the answers that I know. Why do I do this? If you have, for example, a, a dictionary in your application of about 2,500 different words, that's very, very hard to classify. If I give you 2,500 properties of something, the, a description of an object, would you be able to tell me exactly which object that is? Probably not. It's very hard to do. Uh, the same goes for a computer and neural networks. That's why we compress this down to a format that does work for us. And we feed this format into a second neural network that will basically classify my data. So it's, it's much more advanced than what I've shown in the uh, uh, earlier slides. But this is what normally happens. This is what we do. Uh, I didn't come up with this idea myself. I, I pulled this off the internet. Someone has done this before and discovered that this works really well for search problems. So in, in how does this work in Deep Learning 4J? Well, it starts out with a, a neural network configuration. Uh, I hope you can read this. If, is this big enough? Yes. Cool. Awesome. So what we do is we build a multi-layer configuration for a neural network using a builder, which is classic, I think, for Java development. I'm missing the factory and the configurator, but I guess they are internally. Um, and I set a random seed. Uh, this is uh, to help the computer fix my random number generator, so it generates the same random numbers every time I'm training my neural network. Uh, we'll get back to that in a minute. Then what I do is I will say, well, in this configuration of my neural network, I want a layer at index 0. And this is a variational automatic encoder. This is basically the part that I've shown before. Uh, that's the left part over here. <laughs> Looks complicated in the picture. The code is still not very small. But I can do this in one pass. I can just say, hey, dear computer, produce me an automatic encoder. I want to start with 1,024 input nodes, and the output is also 1,024 elements big. And I want to have 1, 2, 3, 4 
encoding layers, and one, two, three, four, decoding layers. Basically, it's the arrow in, arrow out. Then I tell the computer how to optimize this. Which last function do I want for this part of my neural network? Uh, this is called the, the last function function. <laughs> um, uh, basically, I say to the, to the computer, well, I want this activation function, rectified linear unit, um, and I want to use a mean square error loss function. What does this do? The mean square error loss function basically measures the distance between my expected output of these layers and the real output. And it is a relative distance. I want to be ex as exact as possible. It's not a categorization problem. It's basically I want to re reproduce the, in the input of my neural network. Um, and then a bunch of other settings that I can configure which are more advanced. At the end of all this, I say, build me this layer. And that's about it. That's, that's the first part of my neural network. OK, on to the next part. I add some more code. I will say, hmm, build me a second layer, the output layer of my neural network. And uh, this has to be 1,024 nodes big as input. And the output is output layer size which is the number of answers that I can give. This is a classification problem. I assign a unique position on the neural network. Each neuron on my output layer represents one answer that I can give. And that's how big my output layer will be. And what I do is I will say, well, give me a softmax activation function. And this time, I don't want to measure the distance. I want to measure, is it the right answer that I'm giving? That's the negative log likelihood. And again, I call build to build this layer. In my previous picture, when I explained the structure of a neural network and how it works, there's an optimizer at the bottom of this picture. In Deep Learning for J, I can say, well, multi-layer configuration, I want an updater, an optimizer of a specific kind to optimize this neural network. So, Basically, what you're doing here is you're building layers and choosing logical blocks to build your neural network. There's no math whatsoever in this. And you can all look it up in the manual what it means and how to do specific tasks with, it, with Deep Learning 4J. Then we'll tell it, oh, use pre-training and backpropagation, basically optimize my neural network in a certain way, and then build the configuration. What I have at this end of this, this piece of rather large code is basically the configuration from a neural network. What does it look like? <laughs> and I was so kind to split it out. So let's skip forward. What happens next? Next, I have to build a neural network itself. I will say, hey, give me a multi-layer network, dear computer, and put in my configuration. And this step compiles my neural network in such a way that it either works on my CPU or my GPU. It does all the nasty C++ bits, all the cruft that you don't want to see. I'll call init, and that's about it. OK. So now I have a structure that's basically capable of compressing down my data to a format that's understandable, and then classify this compressed format in such a way that I know, oh, you typed in this question, that means that it is this answer. But now, how do I encode the data so that I can train my neural network? Well, when you think about a neural network, it's, it's pure, pure numeric values that we're working with. Sadly, however, if I type something in English or in German or in Dutch, it's none of that. It's not numeric. So how am I going to get from these words to a, piece of, to a set of numbers? Well, this, this has three steps. First, we create a vector, basically a table, that's equal to the size of the number of words that I want to understand, usually a few thousand. And uh, whenever I uh, want to uh, store something that goes into a neural network, I will split the text into separate words and look at each word and say, oh, this is the word hello. Find in this table where the word hello is and assign the number one to it. If I en encounter the word hello again, I will increase that number. So what you end up with is basically this. 
my sample data is nothing more than a large vector where each index in this vector represents a single word. Does make sense, right? Cool. So how does this work in Deep Learning for J? It's not very complicated. First, I need a tokenizer, which is capable of splitting my text into separate words. Then I need something that's capable of uh, converting this uh, 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 into a vector, a vectorizer. And basically what I say is, hey, dear vectorizer, I want to tokenize the text in, in this way, this particular way, and uh, uh, use a CSV file as input. So basically what I have on my computer is a CSV file with a lot of questions that can be encoded into numbers. So that's the left side covered. This layer, this input layer, is now 2,500 words long. So there's 2,500 neurons in this layer. It's pretty big. Now to the right side of my neural network. What happens here is what I want to do with my neural network is want to say, for example, um, answer number one is you can find information about the speakers on the speaker page. Now when I ask where can I find information about the speakers, I want that neuron to produce the number one and all the other neurons the number zero, because that would give me the right answer. So how do I do that? Well, I can take another CSV file with all the possible answers and read that into using a CSV record reader. I initialize this with an input file, and then the next thing happens. I first build a map of answers that's basically going to map a number to a specific piece of text. So then I can read all the records from my reader, and each record will contain one single answer. And what I do is I will say, oh, um, give me the number of the records uh, from this file, and use that as the index by which I can find the right answer. Nothing more than a dictionary. OK, so we have the, in the structure of the neural network ready. We have the input ready. We have the output ready. Now let's optimize the neural network. Um, and this is uh, the piece of code that does that. Basically, what happens here is that I want to iterate over all the samples that I have, all the sample questions and the answers that go along with it, and push that through my neural network and optimize the network so that it gets the right answer. And I can do that using the, the function fit. And fit takes in a set of features and a set of labels, and I will then do a single pass forward and then backwards to update the weights. But it isn't enough to update my neural network. Remember the chart where the big slope was? I'm only going to do one step down the slope initially. And I'm going to do that for my whole data set. And you will see a lot of people use the term epochs in this case. An epoch is a single pass over your whole data set. And you have to do several epochs of training before you get something that works, because the weights are updated in very small increments. So that's why the for loop is here. Basically, what I do is iterate over all the data in my data set, update as far as I can get, and then do it all over again, 100 times in this case. At the end of this, you will have a neural network that performs in some way. In my case, I have an accuracy of about 85, 86%. So that means that 86% of the, of the, 86 of the questions that I ask to my neural network will get answered correctly. So it's pretty good, I think. Now on to the last part. I've trained my neural network. That's all well and true. That's cool. I can save it to disk even if I want to. Uh, which is useful because you don't want to train it every time someone asks us a question. Um, but now how to, how to use it? What I've done for my chatbot is basically this. I have a web front end that has a small chat box in it. I'm not going to show it today. I used the emulator to show it at the beginning of the presentation. But normally you would have a small chat window that you can ask questions in. This chat window is connected through uh, Ajax calls to a uh, servlet on my web server um, that basically uh, allows me to build a chatbot. A chatbot is nothing more than an API that accepts text and outputs text. It's very, very boring 
if you ask me. Uh, you can make it more, more exciting if you want to use something like Dialogflow or Azure bot servers, um, but that's beside the point, I think. Um, this bot servlet then accepts this HTTP call from the web front end and translates it to a message to my chatbot. And this chatbot is going to use my question classifier, which is a wrapper around my neural network, that basically does this. It encodes the input that comes in from the chat message into numbers, pulls it through the neural network, finds the answer that belongs to that, and puts that back into text and sends it back to the user. That's basically what happens. So in this uh, um, classifier, basically what I do is I say to the classifier, predict me the answer that I need to send as a reply text by taking the text from the incoming message. That's on the bot level. When you look at the neural network inside of it, what I do is this. First, I use the factorizer to transform my text into numbers. Then I will tell my neural network, hey, produce some output based on that, which produces a new vector with a set of numbers. And all I need to do is find the one with the highest value. That's the answer I'm going to give. Because although I trained it with vectors that have a perfect one and the rest is zeros, it doesn't output that. It doesn't know. It outputs a, n a series of numbers, and one of them is the highest, and it's probably the answer you want. It's all based on probabilistic programming. So what I do is I take the highest one, and I'll say that's the index of the answer I want to give, and that's what I'm going to return to the user. That's all there is to it. A, I personally feel that it's still very, it's advanced technology, let's be honest, but it's not that it's impossible to learn. Um, here's how you can get started. Give Deep Learning 4J a try. Download it, try it on your machine. If you, even if you don't have a graphics card that's compatible, it still works for small scenarios, for simple things. Um, and um, there's basically three things that you have to keep in mind in this case. You can think up any sort of architecture for neural networks. The range of possibilities is endless. I see new things happen every day. But let's be honest, if you're a normal developer, that's not for you. If you want to have success tomorrow, you're better take a look at the model zoo. There's a standard website for that, which tell you which architecture works best for which kind of problem you're trying to solve. It's a great help. It's still a great help to me and a lot of other people that are way farther ahead in terms of deep learning knowledge. Um, and also start with small experiments. Don't build something very, very complicated. Start with something small like a chatbot and see how that works, and then move on from there. And also what I've learned, TensorFlow is a very cool framework. It's very awesome, but it's also very, very complicated. It doesn't hide all the mathematical formulas for you. Uh, that makes it very powerful, but also problematic. Deep Learning for j however, thinks in terms of layers, loss functions, these, these building blocks that I've shown before. And that makes it a lot easier. If you know those building blocks and you know what kind of thing you're trying to solve, you can build a neural network in Java. So if you want to learn more, if you want to discover what um, uh, my code, for example, you can download it from my uh, GitHub account. Um, uh, it contains everything, including the Azure bot service thing, uh, that if you are interested in that. Um, a model zoo is also very useful if you want to try something yourself. And Deep Learning 4J has an awesome set of documentation that helps you get started in very small increments, installing everything on your computer and building your first model. And if you still think this is awesome, I want to learn more, there's a uh, guy up on YouTube that does a great job teaching machine learning, which is free. Uh, he has about 100 or more videos about machine learning. And with that, um, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Um, if you have any questions besides today, you can still reach me on Twitter, through email, LinkedIn, whatever you want. Thank you.